Central. We'll get started. Those of you who are in the back, there's, there's more room on the forward parts of the steps, especially on this side, uh, if you want to quietly come forward. Welcome back to Personal Choice and Global Transformation. Before we meet Ambassador Swanee Hunt, uh, some matters of business. When I was a Harvard undergraduate, Back in the 1890s, no, actually it was last year, uh, my, my roommates and I uh, put up a sheet of paper on the wall in our Quincy House suite where, um, <laughs> we have some Quincy contingent, uh, where we would write down the names of, of people we considered martyrs and we wanted to honor people who in the pursuit of a gentler world had given what Abraham Lincoln called the last full measure of devotion. And on that paper, on our Quincy House wall, amidst famous names like Gandhi and Rosa Luxemburg and Martin Luther King, there was also the name Karen Silkwood. Karen Silkwood grew up in Texas and in the early 1970s, she was a young lab technician at the Kerr McGee Plutonium Processing Plant in Cimarron, Oklahoma. And at that plutonium plant, she discovered some things that weren't quite as they should be uh, on, on matters of, of how plutonium was being handled. And I won't tell you what path she, she took because tomorrow we are, we are seeing a film portrait of her life uh, showing the film Silkwood. And in this film, Meryl Streep provides what is considered to be a rather faithful rendering of Karen Silkwood's life. We are showing the film tomorrow at 7.30 in Science Center D. D as in determination, D as in defiance, uh, or if you prefer, D as in despair. And some of you will choose to, to write a brief uh, commentary on this film. Uh, if, you, if you choose this as one of the films where you, you want to write a, a, a one paragraph, one substantial paragraph commentary, uh, we ask you to... Uh, answer a question concerning whistleblowers, concerning people who go public about an abuse or crime within an organization. And the question is, did Karen Silkwood choose to become a whistleblower or was she chosen? Did she choose to become a whistleblower or was she recruited to the role by fate and circumstance? or both. I'll read that again. Did Karen Silkwood choose to become a whistleblower or was she chosen? Did she choose to become a whistleblower or was she recruited to the role by fate and circumstance or both? No assignments in this course are due until next Wednesday and the reason for that is that you will be posting the assignments by section 
uh, on the course website, but since we don't have the sections uh, established yet, uh, the, the first assignments will be due, due next Wednesday. That goes for uh, the film comment uh, as well as the, the first of these rapid response reflections described on page seven of the syllabus. Extra syllabi are available if anyone uh, wants to pick one up afterwards. All sessions of this course are videotaped and they can be viewed on the course website from any computer that's on the Harvard network. On Friday of next week, we'll be showing a, a film during the, the regular lecture hour, Jamie Johnson's documentary, Born Rich, about the lives of 20-year-old billionaire inheritors. Uh, and Jamie Johnson, as you know, will be our guest later, later in the term. Because of the length of this film, uh, the class will continue until 4.15 on that day. So if you have any uh, flexibility in your scheduling, uh, you may want to allow that extra 15 minutes. Unlike our other films, Born Rich will not be on reserve at Lamont uh, for the remainder of the term uh, due to copyright reasons. For next week, we are reading Robert J. Lifton's book, Superpower Syndrome, America's Apocalyptic Confrontation with the World. And we need about a dozen brave people to uh, volunteer to ask questions to Professor Lifton. Uh, anyone like to do that? So, a few more people. Great. Uh, everyone who has their hand up and anyone else who has a uh, sudden fit of courage before the end of the hour, if you could please uh, give us your email uh, at, at the end of class. The reason for that is we'll, we'll send you uh, a message with some suggestions and, and ideas uh, about how we do the question process. And finally, we're doing electronic sectioning today and tomorrow. To request a section, you need to go to the course website, which we have uh, conveniently displayed here, click on www links. I don't know what the www stands for, but it seems to work. Um, and then um, you will see several categories and under E is electronic sectioning. Click on that and it gives you uh, instructions uh, in, in Swedish as well as Finnish uh, of how to proceed. I should note that after tomorrow night, the link will no longer work and the electronic sectioning system shuts down. So you can section any time between the end of class today and the middle of the night, uh, the night between Thursday and Friday. Um, beyond that uh, is, is too late. So uh, please make a note to yourself uh, in, in your notebook, on the back of your hand, however, however you'll remember uh, to uh, go to the site uh, before tomorrow late night. Uh, what time you go to the site doesn't affect what section you get put into. Uh, the sectioning process is done by a computer that tries to put everyone into a 6 a.m. Saturday section in Vanserg. Uh, so, <laughs> It, it, it doesn't, doesn't affect the outcome. Now there's a special note. Uh, if you are a student cross-registering into the course from a different part of Harvard or from a different university, uh, in that case you need to take a number of, uh, you need to take an important step and we have it on the board here uh, to email uh, this address H-E-R-S-2 at FAS, uh, or to call 496-4372, and you will get a special code number that allows you to be treated by the system as an, a Faculty of Arts and Sciences student, even though you are with another division. Uh, so if, you're, if, if that applies to you, please send that email or make that call today after class 
uh, to allow time for that process to, to work. And now, from the reading, you know that today's guest, Ambassador Swanee Hunt, was the American ambassador in Vienna and a leader, a leader of peace-building efforts during and after the wars in the former Yugoslavia. You know also that she directs the Women and Public Policy Program at the Kennedy School, where she teaches as well as the Hunt Alternatives Foundation. And let me add that, that Swanee Hunt is a model for the risk-taking on behalf of others that is the, a central theme of, of this course. We read, for example, of how Swanee transformed the American Embassy in Vienna from being a mere facilitator of business contacts and by national goodwill into a gathering place for courageous, politically engaged women from throughout the region, some of whom would stay in, in her home as they sought to build peace in the former Yugoslavia, as they sought to build a strong civil society in Eastern Europe. A very unusual role for an embassy and an, amb and an ambassador. Swanee Hunt is also a champion of this course and of last year's sister course. She's, she's visited every year, and at a time during the Iraq War, when my teaching was under fire, and Rush Limbo was telling his listeners that I should get the heck out of America, Swanee Hunt championed the course and made a case for its value in a Harvard education. So it is with both admiration and affection that I ask you to join me in welcoming Ambassador Swanee Hunt. Thank you. It's the mother in me, I think, but there are like 12 empty seats. So anyone who really doesn't want to be sitting on the floor, just so that you know, if you come up here, you can see where the empty seats are on each side. And you're welcome to do that right now. So feel free. Yeah. And um, if you have the personal courage. <laughs> <laughs> As usual, we will begin right away with questions, and Kate Holbrook will pose the first question. Ah, you didn't tell me you were going to do that, Kate. <laughs> you have been described as a strong woman, tough, a steel magnolia, as you say in your essay. Is the mic on? Can you all hear that? You can. It's just I who can't. You told me that. Okay. All right. I'm a steel magnolia. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what in your life has turned you into that kind of a person. Oh. Oh, you know, I, my guess is that as science unfolds in this building and, and uh, elsewhere, we're going to discover more and more of this is about DNA. Uh, but there are life experiences that are really important, too. Uh, like, for example, in Texas, you learn to smile. That's why they talk like this. Because, you know, <laughs> that, um, women smile a whole lot. And so that's part of the magnolia part. Uh, my mother used to stop me if I was going down the hall in the house, and she'd say, honey, why aren't you like, smiling? You didn't smile as, uh, because something was going right. Smile was the default. But... Um, in terms of the tough part, that was, that was not the way I was raised. I was raised to be very gentle, and uh, I was constantly disappointing my mother in that respect, I think. I went to a school called Hockaday, <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and I should tell you all that I tried out for every varsity team and I didn't make any of them. But the coach felt so sorry for me after a while that she made me the manager. And uh, I got to wrap my friend's legs for shin splints, you know. <laughs> uh, and then I, I would try out, uh, I would be in all kinds of clubs. 
but no one ever nominated me to be president of anything. And I remember on awards day, I was sitting in a you know, big auditorium like this, and they were naming the people who were going to be cum laude. It was a small school, so 72 girls were graduating, and there were seven cum laude. And they, they named the first six, and then they said Swanee Hunt. And my friend Kathy Castleman, who was sitting back there, she said, uh oh! <laughs> Nobody could believe that I could be cum laude. I mean, I, it just wasn't my image of excelling in particularly anything. So those of you, those of you who really have excelled, think it over. You may have already peaked. Right? <laughs> <laughs> There's room for people like me who may be coming along. Okay. <laughs> Allison Smith has our next question. Um, in Career Moves, you tackle the issue of being a female leader in your own experience as a woman and an outsider among international experts during the Balkan War, right. um, where the women of Sarajevo's quote, voices suddenly weakened when they were in the presence of men. Um, it seems it is not just men that can have a hard time taking women seriously, but also women themselves. Um, as a powerful woman challenging the status quo, how do you convince not only others, but also yourself that your voice deserves to be heard? And what inspired you to take your dreams and opinions seriously as a young girl growing up in a southern entrenched patriarchy? Mm. Um, I'll tell you a story. I'll tell you a story about growing up in Dallas in the 50s. I was born in 1950. Uh, it, it was so male. I mean, Dallas is oil and gas. And so of, of all of the industries in the United States, that is one of the most conservative. And by the time I was in my late 20s, so now we would be uh, in the late 70s, Martin Luther King has... Junior has come and gone. I mean, the civil rights movement, the women's movement is full throttle, et cetera. The Petroleum Club, which my family was very involved in, was still closed to women. And so I made a uh, lunch date with the vice president of Hunt Oil Company because I was a part owner of Hunt Oil Company. I made a date to go up and to have lunch with Tom. And I made it under my name, Swanee Hunt. Now, with a name like Swanee, nobody knows if you're a man or a woman. And so we get to the top of, of the elevator at the Petroleum Club, the doors open, and there is this handsome, tall, black man in a red coat. He's the major D. And he, uh, he says, welcome, and there's a table for you in here. And that's the ladies' dining room. The ladies' dining room is for either two women, if for some reason they they got lost and ended up at the petroleum club, or for uh, if a man for some reason brought his sister or his wife, which rarely happens. So he pointed to the ladies' dining room, and I said, oh, no, thank you. I have a table actually reserved, reserved in the main dining room. And he said, we have a beautiful table for you here by the window. <laughs> and one of the things you all have missed out on is assertiveness training. Do you, ask your mothers. Anyway, we did this in the 60s. We, you learned to just say it over and over and over when people said no to you. And so uh, he said, the table's here. And I said, no, the table's there. And I know because I specifically asked for a table in the main dining room. Now, meanwhile, Tom, the vice president of the company, is dying. He goes, Swanee, I get it, Swanee. OK, you made your point, Swanee. Let's go, Swanee. And I said, no, Tom. I have a table reserved in the main dining room. And this, this tall black man looked at me and said, I can take you to that table, but it will cost me my job. And what I realized that was that it didn't matter how famous my last name was in Dallas. I had more in common with him than I did with the other people of privilege who were eating in the main dining room. That was a very, very important lesson for me. And it was a galvanizing moment for me. We got
got into the elevator, we went down, we got a sandwich and ate in Tom's office. But it has stayed with me. It's important that you not let these experiences um, defeat you. A, a, a year or, or later, <coughs> my brother had opened a hotel and uh, we were being shown, the three sisters were being shown around at the suites at the top of the hotel. They were all uh, named for leaders in Fort Worth history. And at the end of being shown the six luxury suites, uh, my sister Helen said, how come they're, they're all named for men? And the manager who was showing us around, right on the money, so to speak, and said, uh, well, actually, we, we did look into that, and there weren't any women in Fort Worth history or something, you know, stupid. <laughs> and and uh, I, I said, you know, I, I bet. And so I hired a researcher, and she found that a woman had started the school system and had started the post office and started the hospital, you know, all the guys were starting the slaughterhouses and punching holes in the ground and, you know, <laughs> and things like that. Uh, and so we came up with an idea. We said, look, how about this? We take these four women, great women of Fort Worth history, and we'll put their names on one plaque. We don't want to take away any of the suits from the guys. And we'll put the plaque by the fountain in the lobby. And yeah, easy, right? Wrong. There there was this conversation that happened out of earshot between the manager and the men in the family. And the manager came back and said, you know, that's not going to be possible. We, we can't do it. He said, oh, come on, can't you do that? <laughs> uh, no, can't do that. Now, the three sisters who owned 75% of the stock responded, oh, the manager said no, and 75% of the stockholders said oh. Sometimes you learn more by those moments that you're least proud of. It's really important to remember that. It's not just the race that you won, the competition, the, the glory, the leading part in the play. It's the time you walked out on the stage and completely screwed up that stays with you, and what you've got to do is learn the lesson from those times. And you take the anger, and you don't let it stay anger, you transform it into action. <coughs> Who else? Thank you for coming. You're welcome. When Cynthia Enlow spoke to us on Monday, she expressed reluctance about using female stereotypes, such as what you describe as the emotionality of women, in order to forward particular, usually feminist, causes. Even if studies do confirm such trends in women, do you think the possible social gain gains in social justice outweigh the potential damage to the elasticity of what it means to be a woman? I know what you mean. Okay. Um, <laughs> Cynthia is great. Did you all enjoy Cynthia? I hope. Isn't she? I think she's terrific. And uh, Cynthia has a very good point to make. I mean, Cynthia tells it like it is. She is who she is, etc. And uh, Brian and, and Kate were saying that, that when she was here talking to you, she talked about how she used to dress up in sundresses and finally said, you know, to, to hell with this. I'm going to be who I am, etc. Uh, this is, there's no easy answer to this because, first of all, stereotypes are very dangerous because when you have a generality uh, it, and you try to apply it to an individual, it often doesn't fit. But stereotypes are usually based on something. They're based on some kind of experience. And so you don't want to be stupid like, uh, oh, what do you mean women are more emotional? How can you say something like that? How can you say something like that? You didn't even believe what he said to me. I can't believe he said I was a little emotional. I mean, no, it just, what can I say? I, I would like to say that it's not so, but um, my experience, if you go into, if, if you go into a room that's filled with girls and you go into a room that's filled with boys, if, if when you get to a certain age, there's a real difference 
in what the, not just the words they're using, but the energy in the room. There really are differences. Maybe it's all a social construct. When you say that to an anthropologist, they may say, you know, yes. When you say it to a biologist, they start laughing at you. Uh, or a developmental psychologist, you know, like Jerry Kagan here at Harvard. You know, he, he'll say, come on, you know, just look at the way that the little bitty kids act. And, oh, it makes such a difference if you've had kids. I mean, I've had a boy, I've had a girl, and I tried so hard to raise my girl with fire trucks and raise my boy with dolls, and it just couldn't make it work, even for, <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't get there. And, and by the way, my little boy was much sweeter than my little girl. I mean, I, <laughs> frankly, I liked him a lot more. But, <laughs> oh. but you know, my, my daughter was hell on wheels, but she would comb the mane and the tail of my little pony for hours and hours and hours and hours, you know, because it was this sort of nurturing, taking care of thing. My guess is that a lot of that is hardwired. Hmm. Yes. Oh, actually, we'll, we'll stick with uh, a ah. list of questions for a bit okay. more. And I, oh, that's you. It's me next, Aha. yeah. And then we'll come to <laughs> open questions after that. Uh, Swani, this question connects with your experience with dealing with change makers at many different levels of, of power in the world, from activists in Bosnia who, who couldn't dream of having the, the laptop and cell phone that, that most Harvard students and, and teachers have, to, to idealistic, ambitious students uh, in the college, in the Kennedy School, uh, to people who work in the foundation world as progressive philanthropists, and the different levels of, of power and influence in the society. My, my feeling is that most of us in the 02138 area code feel that we urgently need to acquire more power in order to make a difference in the world and that we're ready to spend a lot of our lives doing that, uh, that it may even be better to try to win a great deal of power through the educational system, through making connections, through uh, learning particular skills, before we try to make any changes in the world, because if we become active too soon, we may be uh, put aside as a rebel, a boat rocker, someone uh, who, who should be stopped by the gatekeepers of our continuing climb. One could even see Harvard as this vast collection of secret agent moles uh, in, the, in spy lingo, each trying to burrow their way to the centers of power one day to blossom and make a difference. And I'm, I wonder how you see that dilemma, because on the one hand, there's a logic to uh, to waiting to acquire more power and influence before doing too much. On the other hand, it seems like it can take several lifetimes to, and b before one would even uh, kind of connect with this troubled world that, that all of us in this room feel we want to make better. Yeah. I remember there was a very important book. Uh, it was studying philanthropy, and it was called The Habits habits of the heart. And what it described was how people who do end up going out and changing the world, they develop those habits very early. So this notion that, well, you know, right now I'm a student and I've got to really pay attention to uh, my, my coursework and uh, Someday I'm going to be able to be involved in volunteer work, but right now my job is to make sure that I get the A's so that I can get into the graduate school, that, so that I can, so that I can, so that I can, so that I can. The, the, the danger is that by the time you go, get up that ladder, you become a different person from who you are right now as you're making those choices. So I would urge you to find multiple ways any time, at any, at any year of your life, that multiple ways that you are out of your comfort zone 
and, and participating in, reaching out, involved in, messing around in <laughs> some kind of work that, in your opinion, is contributing to the greater good. And by greater good, I'm not talking about you. Okay, <laughs> you're good, but you're not the greater good. <laughs> oh. Someone was asking me this weekend, it was actually my daughter's boyfriend, about, <laughs> he was talking about, well, you know, he has this difficult problem, which is the balance between himself as a free spirit and, uh, and responsibility. And my daughter very wisely said, well, I'm not sure that's the dichotomy. I think that with responsibility comes relationship, which is its own freedom, the freedom to know love in a relationship. I think the same applies to the, the question of how much am I supposed to be feeding myself and my own career and my own development uh, versus how much am I supposed to be giving to others? Because it is in giving to others that you will discover that your own development has been the most enriched. St. Francis had it right. St. Francis of Assisi. Do you remember? Can anyone quote it? Come on, y'all. Come on. Yes. It is in giving that we receive. Ryan Thorson. Um, in your position in Austria, you saw a need in Kosovo and responded to it. Um, with so many issues facing women in so many areas of the world, how do you decide where your energy can be most effectively spent? Well, that's a question every one of you has, isn't it? How do you decide where you're going to be the most effective. There are people who make plans. They make a lot of plans. And they know that they're going to go to Harvard, and then they're, after that, they're going to apply to law school, and here are the two law schools they're considering. And then after that, they're going to be in a firm in New York City, probably, pay off some debts, and then after that, blah, 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 blah. You know, I have never found that life works that way. But if you're a planner, go ahead, plan. The chances of life evolving according to your plan are probably, probably less than 10%. So plan if you need to. Uh, but what the real task in living is keeping your balance. It's not where you get to. It's how you keep your balance along the way. So when you ask me that question, there, there isn't any clear-cut decision tree for me. It's more somebody calls me and says, did you know that this is happening? And I say, oh my God, you know, this is, this is horrible. Let me see if I can get somebody else involved. And, and then one thing leads to another. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of New Age thinking. There's people who say, oh, that's the universe or, or that's a divine. Something. I, I actually don't ascribe to that. But, but I do very much have the experience that there, I have never been at a point where there weren't very important needs around me that I could respond to. Unfortunately, maybe, about the world. The... The task is your openness. It, it's not hoping something meaningful will come your way. It's being open to what is to what is meaningful all around you. Ronaldo Rossio, you compare. Thank you, um, Ambassador Hunt. Can you uh, please comment on your personal grappling with circumstances in which uh, the policy of the United States, which you served in the diplomatic corps? Um, when that contravenes the best interests of the women in the countries that you're trying to help? For example, how do you cope with the decreased credibility that the U.S. has when, uh, with women's groups in Iraq when it allows the reinstitution of Sharia law and what course of right. action do you right. go through? Sure. Uh, I was just in Baghdad, in fact, so let me 
say something about that. I've done three trainings with Iraqi women, have um, several day trainings at a time. For about 80 Iraqi women, it includes the women who are on the governing council, the women who've been elected to the Baghdad City Council, uh, women political party leaders, et cetera. And the work I do with them is helping them hone their message. How do you talk to a policymaker? You're only going to have you know, 90 seconds. What is your message? Or if you're going to have four minutes, what is your message? And we rehearse and, and we talk about how you talk to the media and how that's different from, from uh, how you talk to policymakers. And it's, it's good stuff. Um, so I did a, a training in December, mid-December, in Amman. Now, two of the people who came to this training were members of the Governing Council. Governing Council was appointed by the CPA, the Coalition Provisional Authority, headed up by Ambassador Bremer, an American. Uh, so Jerry Bremer's like the, you know, the king of Iraq for now. And he had all the power, and he had this 24-member Governing Council, and does anyone know how many women out of the 24? Three. Uh, that was after having had a meeting of for 500 future Iraqi leaders where they had 500 men and, and two women, et cetera. So the, the cards were already dealt at this point. The most outspoken, wom outspoken woman on the governing council was murdered. She was gunned down. Uh, that left two. The World Bank and, and I and the UN put on this week-long training in Amman. The two women, surviving women from the Governing Council, came to the training. The day they left Baghdad to come to the training, the Governing Council, all men now, held an election to fill the place of the murdered woman. It was an unannounced um, election, and they elected someone on an 11 to, uh, a 12 to 11 vote, someone who would support Sharia law, a woman. So this is the kind of difficulties uh, that, that you face as a woman in these situations. It's not, and people say, oh, that's so difficult because of Iraqi culture. Yeah, right, but it was the Americans who appointed the governing council. It was the Americans who said, we're going to be sure that we have an exact proportion of Sunnis and Shiites and Kurds on this governing council and didn't care if 55% of the population is women. So the, the standards, it's not about developed nations and, and not developed nations. It's about a general way we have of thinking about women where, well, I went to the Pentagon, and um, this was in April, right after the fighting had stopped, and I said, you have got to get women into the process. You have got to bring them in. And the person at the Pentagon, who was the top guy there, uh, interacting with Baghdad, said, we've got to get the situation secure, and then we'll think about the women. Then we'll think about the women's issues, he said. I said, no, no, what you're not understanding is that it's not going to be secure. You have got to bring the women in to help make it secure. But it is a foreign concept to 99% of the policymakers in Washington, at the UN. The UN is one of the worst, one of the worst places in terms of women. They have all the right words, but they pass resolutions that they, they just ignore. Pamela Kamwati. I didn't answer your question. Who asked the question? You did. I didn't answer. How do I deal with it? <laughs> well, I am really persistent. I, I take on big problems that will take 20 years. And I keep bringing in uh, colleagues along the way. I convinced this person and that person and this person and that person. And, and I'm interested in social movement much more than one particular situation here or there. So what we're trying to do is change the whole way that people think about violent conflict. So 
So there's a conflict brewing. Nepal will probably be one of the next wars. A conflict brewing in Nepal. And anyone here from Nepal? Okay. Uh, I'm sure that there are policymakers at the White House and the State Department, et cetera, who are saying, okay, when will we consider military intervention? Should we have economic sanctions at this point? What are we doing at the diplomatic level in terms of the marshes? Uh, I would like for on their list to be, okay, who are the women's groups on the ground and are we supporting them? That needs to be on the checklist. And that's, that's what we're aiming toward and that's what we, we take apart the Washington establishment of the US, or the UN establishment. And we, we analyze who are the power players and who are the people who could stop this initiative. And then we come up with a strategy for getting to each one of those. Does any of you, do you all know much about public speaking? One of the ways you know how you're doing with public speaking is if there's one call, then that could be someone choking. If there are two coughs, it could be cold season. If there are three coughs, however, you have to change what you're doing. We're at two right now. But <laughs> if, you're, if there are three coughs in the auditorium, then you have to change the level of your voice or you walk around or you can I'm not sorry if you can get real soft, and that'll sometimes get people to, to listen. Okay. Where were we, Kate? <laughs> Hi, I actually had a question about um, One Mother's efforts to bring peace to Sri Lanka. Um, that article. Yes. I'm actually Sri Lankan myself, and I know Mrs. Dandasa in the article. Um, something that I've seen in Sri Lanka, we've had lots of awareness campaigns that try to mobilize the people to take a stand on the issue. Um, but almost always the campaigns that succeeded in getting international attention, no attention. Uh, the speaker, the public face of the campaign as such has like a very personal loss or has experience attached to seeing the war. And there's a lot of other people who've done a lot of work to try to generate interest, but simply because they don't have like an emotional appeal to the people, very little gets done at, if you have any thoughts on that. And anything that one can do to make those campaigns that are promoted to a personal viewpoint more visible and relevant. Hey, it, the mic cuts off and on, so it's hard. But you were saying it's hard to get attention, consistent attention, or attention to Sri Lanka, and and then yes, yes, right, yes, yes. Well, part of your question is about human nature, isn't it? And whether or not you have to appeal to some way that you connect to me uh, in order to get people to, to act. And what, what Visaka Dharmadasa does by talking about her missing son is she appeals to the parents, essentially, who say, oh my God, that could be my son. And I think that if you look at the social movements, you will find over and over and over, they actually are born out of, of pathos and uh, human suffering and people who are willing to describe that suffering and, uh, and build a following out of that. Now, the human suffering doesn't get you far enough. There are plenty of examples of someone who had uh, a, a child kill, let's say, who starts a handgun movement, and it fizzles out. Did y'all wonder what happened to the Million Mom March, by the way? Remember the Million Mom March? You know, it, it fizzles out because of, of organizational problems. So you may need a person at the beginning who has that personal story to tell, but you very quickly need to add in strategies and tactics and uh, what is the message management here, and who are our leaders going to be, and how many cells do we need to have across? So I think it takes both. We have time for a couple of spontaneous questions. Um, why don't we take one from a woman, one from a man, and we will ask that if you could just say your name and your concentration uh, before your question, your first name and your concentration 
for the benefit of, of the rest of us. Hi, Ambassador Hunt. Uh, Hi. Thank you for being here. Um, uh, my name is Yugoslav Kapitanovic, uh, and I was born in Belgrade, Yugoslavia. My dad is uh, Muslim, my mom is Croatian Catholic. And uh, about half an hour ago, my dad sent me an email from, uh, from Sarajevo, and uh, I, I wanted to read you a part of what he said, and I'd be happy to respond to Yesterday, I was in Sarajevo for the commemoration of the 20th anniversary of the 84 Olympic Games, one year after you, my dear son, were born. Uh, your sister was already old enough to understand and remember the experience, uh, one of the most inspiring and majestic to take place in the former Yugoslavia. Then, for the first time, did the rest of the world learn a little bit about us, about Yugoslavia, that we weren't just another country under the Iron Curtain, that we were an independent part of the civilized and democratic world, who unfortunately did not have the opportunity to learn more about us. Now, 20 years later, as the countries around us, which were mus much less developed than we were at the time, continue to improve, we remain the biggest idiots in the world, driven uh, into a stupid war in order to destroy people and one of the most beautiful countries in the world. Uh, civilization and culture have been replaced with violence and primitivism, and now eight years after the signing of the Dayton Accord, again we find power, uh, we find in power the same individuals who caused and fueled a war that destroyed a country, a people, and a sense of civility. That's the way it is in Croatia, and Serbia, and unfortunately in Bosnia as well. Everyone has their reasons for tears and RFR for the fact that the spirit of the Sarajevo Games will never happen again, nor can it. Things like this happen once in a lifetime, or they never happen at all. Do you agree with this statement? Uh, do you think that we will experience the spirit of the Sarajevo Games in the Balkans? Um, and what is the responsibility of the international community and of uh, specific individuals in affecting that change? Okay, I'm, this is going to be the last one because I'm going to tell you a story and it takes more than uh, when I was ambassador, it was the 50th anniversary of the liberation of the concentration camp Mauthausen. It was, I was there 50 years after the war ended, World War II. Now, as you know, Austria was, was just uh, dotted with concentration camps. I was, I was presiding for the United States in a ceremony in a camp where 120,000 people had died. And there was a marine color guard, and I was walking in the middle, and I would go forward at some point and lay a wreath in, in a plaza in this concentration camp. The concentration camp, because it was the 50th year anniversary, was jammed with people. And they were, I was at the back of the line, the United States was in the back <laughs> with the V. And, uh, and walking back to get in behind all, at the end of the line with all the other diplomats, I saw the Israeli ambassador, I embraced him. I saw my friend, the German ambassador, she was wearing big sunglasses because she'd been crying so much, which was very hard for her. I embraced her, I went back and stood in line. It took an hour to get, inching our way forward, to get up to the plaza. And there were people all around who were wanting to touch me. And because it was the United States, we are the ones who had come rolling across the plains and discovered, accidentally discovered this concentration camp. Nobody would, knew it was there. So all these people were reaching out and trying to just touch me, saying, shalom, shalom, or, or grazie, or uh, merci. It, any language from all the different family members who had survived, who had come back to their camp. And I had the feeling, as I inched my way forward, I would, was never prouder to be an American. I had not grown up with an appreciation of the military, but being there in Austria and for the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II, I had come to appreciate the U.S. military in a way I'd never had before. So we get up to the point, and the, he announces my name, the, the announcer, 
Ambassador Swanee Hunt, Vereinigten Staaten, and the crowd bursts into cheers. And I lean down and I unroll the ribbon and I go and I sit down between Simon Wiesenthal, the great Nazi hunter, and Viktor Frankl, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning from his experience in the Holocaust. And I'm sitting there and all of the speeches are about never again, never again, never again. And I could have felt so wonderful, and I would say even smug, if I didn't know that back in Vienna, on my giant mahogany desk, was a pile of telegrams. And they had titles like Strangulation of Sarajevo Complete, Srebrenica About to Fall, these enclaves where they were, had become completely surrounded by Serb forces where Bosnian Muslims had gathered to try now for years to live under siege and the policy of the United States and the president that I represented and the country I represented, the policy was, mm, let's wait and see if we really do have to get involved. You know, the Europeans don't really want us. They, they, they said that this is, their own, this is their own mess. Let them handle it. Ah, you know, we